So over control at leaning people tend to lack receptivity and openness. Okay, so might not want to take risks and they're really hyper vigilant for threat like we were talking about. And they don't really want to do new things and they tend to discount feedback that's critical that doesn't really fit their point of view very quickly. So it makes it actually very hard to have an open, receptive relationship with a, a maladaptive or controlled person. So if you think about someone that might not be very flexible, they probably have very rigid routines. They prefer order and structure, hyper-perfectionistic. They really see mistakes everywhere, especially in themselves. And they like to compulsively plan and rehearse. That was Hope Arnold on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists committed to cutting-edge, integrative, and evidence-based strategies for living well. On this podcast, we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. I am Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. We hope this podcast offers you ideas for how to live a full and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Diana, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is your self-control out of control? A little. <laughs> At times, you know, I listen to this episode and sometimes it's the case that someone's going down the checklist of symptoms and you're checking all of them. And I think that was certainly the case for me in listening to this episode on over control because I definitely lean in that direction. How about you, Debbie? I, I'm more in the middle, which I talk about in this episode. And actually, I think I scored slightly over-controlled, but I actually think that's, I've had to learn to be a little more over-controlled than I naturally am. And I think I actually, I, I think I am in the middle, but leaning slightly under-controlled, which is I think probably part of our dynamic with each other. Absolutely. And what, what over-controlled looks like is these these aspects of having a lot of control over your behavior, both, you know, on the outside, really focused on details and um, not very flexible when things don't go your way. <laughs> and I, I definitely experienced that for myself. And in some ways it's, it's quite functional and it's, that's how you get through a PhD program or how you, you know, run a long race, but in other also maybe more personal ways, it, it's not always the most effective. Yes, but I think that is worth acknowledging. We really do value a lot of the things that go along with over control, like being able to control your emotions, you know, following the rules of society, doing things right, staying organized. Like those are all, those really are all valued. And I think when it's in its very extreme form, it definitely does have the problematic side. Mm -hmm. So I was it, thinking about when she was talking in the episode about when my son was two and he took a stapler and he stapled the staple all the way through his finger. So it went in one side and out the other. Ouch. <laughs> see the whole and we took him to the ER and the ER doctor had to do this process of getting out pliers and pulling the staple out. And he was the most calm, centered, probably over-controlled person I've ever met. And I was so grateful that he had that temperament and that characteristic. So yes, it, it, it can be very, very helpful. And it's actually something I really appreciate, um, though the opposite in you, Debbie, is that sometimes you're not so rigid about things and you show your emotions and you can be flustered or um, be flexible. So that's the other side of it. Yeah. Well, and in all fairness, you can too, Diana. It seems like you've You've worked toward the middle, right? I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> so Hope Arnold in this interview, she talks about some of the downsides though. And I think sometimes this idea of over control shows up in clinical practice because when people lose flexibility and they can become actually overly rigid and rule bound or perfectionistic, bigger though is the social consequence. So people can end up feeling quite lonely, have difficult, have difficulty being open in their relationships when they're so over-controlled, it can be really hard to break in there and have close relationships with people like this. 
it can be hard for others to connect with them. Yeah, as well. And they're not getting that kind of feedback of maybe enthusiasm or engagement, which is the the signal for us to move in that you're safe. So if you're over controlled and not showing a lot of facial expression or showing um, excitement, then people may not want to approach you as much. Or not showing vulnerability. You know, I think that sometimes when people are really good at controlling their emotions, almost too good at controlling their emotions, it can feel really scary to let their guard down, but it's actually quite important in relationships to be able to do that. Absolutely. I worked a lot initially early on with eating disorders. That was my research and uh, worked in a treatment center for quite a while. And with, especially with anorexia, this is something that we see. And what's interesting is that with anorexia, that it's an over control, not only of controlling food or controlling exercise, there's also an over control of emotional experience internally. And oftentimes people experience what's called Alex, Alex, which is inability to even understand your own emotions or experience emotions or name your emotions. And what was, what's sort of interesting is that for the individual that is experiencing this over control on the outside, it may look like they, that they have things, you know, in order, but inside it can feel really out of control and scary. And then it also can feel like a seat of power that there's this euphoria that can happen when you feel like you've got everything under your control, but it's this false power. I think that's important to acknowledge that there is a powerful, there's something reinforcing about it, right? Which is that powerful feeling Mm -hmm. and that feeling that, oh, when everything's under control, it's all okay. That feels Mm -hmm. good, right? And I think as someone who probably, you know, doesn't, isn't quite in that place, sometimes I look at my life and then people who are more over control and I feel a little jealous, like, oh, they're what my their life must be so nice because everything's so orderly. Yeah. But what if the orderly is making you feel miserable? You know, someone that has something like obsessive compulsive personality disorder and their house has to be perfect before they can leave it. That's really stressful. If your house has to be perfect before you can leave your house, because then you're having to wake up at 5 a.m. to make your house perfect or containing your kids (laughs) so that they don't Mm -hmm. mess up anything. Yeah. Or if it's not perfect, it distresses you. I think I had a client, this was years ago. I had a client who was definitely over-controlled and she would come in and she would once in a while make a comment about how this pile of books and papers I had in my office, like on top of a, you know, filing cabinet was just growing over time. And it like really bothered her that this was not neat and tidy. And of course, just to be sort of clinically provocative, I just would kind of be like, huh, yeah, and kind of leave it and we talk about it. And, um, but you know, I thought, wow, yeah, if you have everything like that, that you come across kind of bugs you, I could see how that can be a problem. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a lot of what Hope talks about is how to find the middle path with people. So get us into, if you err on the side of over control, where, where, where is a middle way of living? So it's not so stressful. If you find yourself under controlled, how do you find yourself more towards the middle? And I think that's why we balance each other out, Debbie, because you can remind me to not be so controlling about things. And then I can remind you that the episode needs to go out. That's right. On time. Like, um, where's your episode? Well, you joked that I probably did this episode on this topic on purpose because of the podcast. To, yeah, to, to to help you out with me as your co-host. <laughs> Maybe it could it could change a few things in our dynamic. Yeah, yeah. So I'm working on it. Thank you for having Hope on. It's a great episode. I'm sure if you don't relate to it as a listener, you probably have a family member or friend or a client that this would really fit for and hopefully opens your eyes and increases compassion for them and also a little bit of um, strategies of how to, how to work with them. I'm delighted to introduce Hope Arnold, who's here to talk to us today about over control. And we're also going to talk in a separate episode about radically open dialectical behavior therapy. Welcome, Hope. Thank you. It's great to be here. So Hope and I both have practices in Denver, Colorado. Hope is the founder of RODBT Denver. Mm -hmm. She's a senior clinician and trainer in radically open DBT. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit, Hope, about how you got interested in RODBT. Sure. Yes. So I uh, am a 
implant into Denver. I guess I'm not a native. I, I'm from Houston, and I used to work at a large DBT center in Houston, Texas. And one of the things that I started to notice was that uh, there were certain clients that weren't getting better with traditional DBT. And I had one particular client who said to me, uh, this is not working. She was very adamant. This is not working. And I thought, oh, she's just trying or something was going on. And I was very arrogant about it. And I remember thinking, uh, you know, if I start really analyzing what she's saying, you know, what's not working? Mindfulness wasn't really working for her. And emotion regulation, she didn't need more of it. And so what did she need? And she actually needed to learn to chill out, be a little less controlled and a little less rigid. And so um, actually my mentor and a boss at the time, Karen Hall, um, had started to learn about ROGBT. And she said, go to this training. And I was like, okay. So I did. And I thought, oh, well, this is it. <laughs> this is an amazing therapy. And it's for disorders of over control. And I just thought this can help so many people that aren't getting better with traditional treatments. Mm -hmm. Well, you must have loved it because now you're a senior clinician and trainer. <laughs> and we're going to learn all about it today over control. Mm -hmm. You're the founder of RODBT here in Denver. And mm -hmm. you specialize in particular um, concerns or disorders. What are some of your areas of specialty? Sure. So, so the two biggest ones we see are I see and RODBT therapists see are chronic depression and chronic anxiety. So sort of treatment resistant in both areas. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Autism spectrum disorders. Anorexia. And then some additional eating disorders like uh, sometimes they kind of purging or binging that's a subtype that's over control leaning and that's actually kind of a new emerging cool thing in the eating disorder community and maladaptive perfectionism in general okay so a yeah. lot of things and they have something yeah. in common which is over control that's correct and you have a blog what's the name of your blog my blog is so there's i have one on psych central and that's called radical hope love it radical they, hope yeah and it's Perfect. all about <laughs> it's all about uh over control and RODBT. And then I also have one on my personal RODBT Denver website, which is, you can just go to that RODBTDenver.com. Great. We'll link to that on our webpage along with other resources that we talk about today. Cool. Awesome. So here's the most important part of your introduction, Hope. Mm -hmm. Which are you? The listeners want to know. Are you over <laughs> or under control? Are you going to disclose? Yeah, absolutely. That's a big part of the treatment is for clinicians to know which way they lean. So I definitely lean OC. And um, I think, you know, I know <laughs> that, that you have actually taken the test too. Which way do you lean? So the test is called the Styles of Coping Word Pair Questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So I was almost exactly in the middle, Hope, but leaning over controlled. Was, oh, okay. But slightly. And I actually was a little surprised by that. And I think what I realized is that I think I'm around a lot of people who are more over controlled than me. So I thought I'd be under, but I'm actually not. I lean over. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah so um, that, the, the thing that you just mentioned, that, that sort of styles of coping word pair, it is not a measure of psychopathology. It is just a measure of which way you lean over or yeah. under control. And what it does is lets us know, you know, when we get in a stressful situation or which way do we tend to like cope with whatever the issue is that's going on. So Definitely. Okay. I score pretty high on the <laughs> over control uh, side. Mm -hmm. Right. You mentioned that before. So you're a little higher than me on over control. Yes. So it's, uh, it's probably very higher than you. <laughs> very higher than me. It's interesting that you are drawn to this work. I'm just saying. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So what do we mean by over control? What is it and how is it different from under control? Sure. So over control and under control are a spectrum. And what I think would be helpful to talk about is the old model of self-control. So if psychological health was sort of like in a, um, on a graph, and the more that you move up the control spectrum, the more healthy people thought that you would be. And actually what we're finding out is that that's incorrect. What is more um, true is that it is more like a bell curve, meaning that both sides, both super under controlled and both super over controlled actually have lots of mental health disorders. So if you're 
uh, in the middle, which is that bell curve, which is sort of like optimal control, people tend to be pretty flexible and pretty healthy and not have pretty significant mental health disorders. But if you're very under controlled, so that's things like borderline personality disorder um, and other kinds of disorders that have a lot of emotion regulation issues like um, bipolar, uh, binge eating, that's on the under controlled side. Those are, you know, equally as um, significant it, mental health issues, but the over-controlled side we're starting to find is actually too much control. So you can, quote unquote, have too much of a good thing. <laughs> and uh, what we see on those side is that chronic depression, chronic anxiety, a lot of the personality disorders that I mentioned that I treat. And so people actually need to learn to relax and chill out a bit. <laughs> so okay. yeah, that's, that's the spectrum of control. Mm -hmm. So what they're controlling, what is it that they're controlling these over controlled types? So you said they need to relax a little bit. How is yeah. it showing up? Like, what does it look like when someone's over controlled? Yeah. So um, generally speaking, you don't see actually that much. They look, they look like there's really nothing wrong on the outside, but inside they're suffering and they're suffering quite a bit and they're suffering very quietly. And not a lot of people tend to know that people that are over controlled have severe mental health disorders until it gets so bad that they actually reach out for help. And they may have been suffering for years before they really do something. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder can be super functional. And I always kind of joke like, what, who doesn't want a surgeon that has a little bit of OCPD with them because, you know, you don't want them to leave a sponge inside of you. You want them to be a little bit anal and uh, very rule governed about how they do things. So a lot of time over control is really reinforced in society because people want people to be sort of um, rule governed and in some ways rigid in, in situations like a surgeon or even possibly a lawyer or uh, kind of doctor. So it can be adaptive. It sounds like there's a certain way in which it, these are maybe people who look good on the surface, get things mm -hmm. done, yeah. um, are maybe organized mm -hmm. or um, hold it together. Yes, that's a great way to say it. Uh, a lot of times what is, is going on is that people are very, um, have very small social signaling that are over controlled. So if you think about the opposite side, under control. Under control is dramatic and erratic and they're running all over the place and they're, you know, if there's food there, they're putting in their mouth and they're having a great time and they're actually a lot of fun, but they need to learn to actually, to actually control uh, all the emotions and they need to emotionally regulate. Over-controlled people are generally speaking pretty good at emotionally regulating, especially externally. You're not going to see a lot. So they need to learn to actually relax a little bit, get in more in touch with free expression and open expression. Okay. So they, they maybe are doing too much emotion regulation and That's need to learn to kind of like feel it and let mm -hmm. it out a little and loosen up. The term is distress over tolerance and over control. Interesting. Yeah, so they're so good at tolerating distress uh, that actually what will happen is that they will spend a lot of time regulating, 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 and then not actually... Um, it's sort of like an avoidance strategy, this over-regulation. I'll give it, if it's okay, I'll give an example. Yeah, give an one. example. Examples are helpful, yeah. So, so um, this is actually, this is a true story. This is an over-controlled leaning therapist that, that I know. Um, and so he um, had saved all of his money up to buy a, the car of his dreams. And when he <laughs> saved and saved and saved, and I asked him, I'm like, how did it go? How's your car? And he's like, it's great. I love it. And he makes no facial expression, no inflection in his voice. He's not really showing even excitement. And he's uh, externally looking like, you know, that he's not all that happy about it. And inside he's going like, I'm super, super happy about all mm -hmm. this. So over control, um, not only does it control the negative emotions, but it also controls the positive emotions. So they might not be actually expressing joy as well. I think as therapists, sometimes we're trained almost to be neutral. Yeah. I've heard the therapists say, I'm feeling very angry. <laughs> it's like, there's no 
anger being expressed. It's like a comment, an observation of their emotions, but it's said in the most like non-angry way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it doesn't make any really any sense because you're you're going like you're saying you're angry, but your face is not showing it and your body's not showing it. So part of over control skill is to get them to actually let people know what's going on inside of them. Obviously context dependent. You know, we're not trying to make someone that's over control move to under control. That's impossible because it's a biological temperament. But uh, what we are trying to do is get everybody closer to the center, you know, so they have that optimal control. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about some of those bio temperament markers. These are characteristics of people who are over controlled. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about what those are? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's a Three, generally speaking, but the first one is called high threat sensitivity. And so that would be um, something like scanning the environment for the thing that could possibly go wrong. And, and the analogy that we use is that if you're walking into the ro a rose garden in particular, you would see the thorns first and not the roses. And so it's actually a kind of very scary world. It's like looking at the world with gray colored glasses rather than rose colored glasses. And this temperament is actually biologically based. So um, RDBT is somewhat based on polyvagal theory. And what it says is that if someone leans threat sensitive, they're going to see the world much more threatening than someone that might have a little bit less threat sensitivity. And it can be actually very... Um, uh, painful to, to live like that. If you think about threat sensitivity, you're receiving all of this data in your brain super, very, very, very fast. So you're receiving stimulus very, very quickly. And so your um, body sort of is kind of always on edge uh, as an over-controlled leaning person. And we're trying to get people to sort of like um, learn how to turn that off a little bit when they choose to. Yeah to notice some of the other things. So it's someone who would walk into a situation and notice all the potential danger or notice the things that could go wrong. Yeah. I mean, it, try to help them notice the other stuff. Yeah. And threat sensitivity um, is, is can be, can be really quite painful for people as you, as you might imagine, it would prevent people maybe from, you know, dating or, or uh, making friends because they're worried about possibly rejection or things like that. You know, what's going to go wrong. A lot of my clients talk about worst case scenario, like their alt brain is always on worst case scenario. And that can be what threat sensitivity is like okay. for someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second one is called high in inhibitory control which is the ability to actually stop an impulse. And the idea of that would be if there is um, something that I might not want to show to people, I would be able to actually stop myself from showing that thing externally. And another way that might happen is that if I uh, make a decision to do something, I'm just going to absolutely stop it. Like an example of a client of mine who... Um, wife gave him some feedback that he was drinking too much. The next day he just stopped it. Literally stopped drinking, never drank again. He's been sober for 30 years. Wow. That's turkey. Yeah. High inhibitory control. Okay. The third one is high attention to details. So our high detail focus processing. So an example of that might be something like, have you ever walked into a room and noticed like a book was kind of like askew? And you just go like, oh, that book, and you maybe like, you know, change it back, or um, and it like bugs you or something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it has an emotional consequence to yeah. something. Um, but but the idea that you actually see the discrepancy is in things. An example of that might be so if you and I are hanging out and sitting at dinner, and you know we're with some friends, and with those friends you say, you know what, oh, my favorite color is purple, and I'm like, oh, then I put the you know Debbie's favorite color is purple in the back of my head. And then what happens is the next day, uh, I'm hearing you talk and you say, oh, you know what? I hope my favorite color is orange. And I'm like, what? I noticed the discrepancy. So this sort of ability to understand patterns and recognize discrepancies and this high attention to detail might actually cause a um, sort of emotional response to whether I want to be friends with you or not over something as small as a color. And so part of what um, is really tough about over control is that the brain is doing this naturally because it's biologically based and it's really, really quick. It's almost like 
noticing these superior pattern recognitions and these ability to notice these discrepancies really, really quick. The other thing to think about too is how functional this could be in jobs like being a CPA or a lawyer or uh, even a therapist could be really, really helpful. Most therapists lean OC, as you might, <laughs> if, if you didn't know, they do. Mm -hmm. a lot of, we have a lot of data on this now. And so this high threat sensitivity, high inhibitory control, high detail focus processing goes into being over control. And then that other thing of low reward sensitivity, you know, my, I was talking about my friend who doesn't really get excited. That's, you know, kind of the opposite part of this where not only are they threat sensitive, but their excitement system isn't really turned on very well. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of an up and down of it. And yeah. Sometimes the downs can cause suffering. I, I was thinking about the example of the, the guy who just quit drinking. Yeah. That seems like it could come in handy. It is. Is there a downside to that? Well, it's really wonderful, actually, because sometimes when an OC person makes a decision, they just make it and it's done. And then they can, you know, if someone's like, okay, well, I'm going to quit my job and go to grad school and finish grad school, they might actually just do it. Uh, or they uh, have the ability to do this, do apply themselves in, in ways that are really, really functional for goals. Um, and they're very good problem solvers also. But the problem with it might be that it's the jump to problem solving rather than actually assessing and going like, is there really a threat here? Just because you said purple one day and orange the next day doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's not a moral judgment to have a different color that you, <laughs> that you right. like. So it could and make so it hard to be around people because you're inflexible or say you set a goal and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this and you do it no matter what. But what right. if there's times when maybe that goal isn't really helpful? Correct. Yeah. It, or if you jump to setting a goal without really fully assessing the situation um, or really fully understanding all of the moving parts or even thinking that your uh, per perceptional bias is correct. We see that a lot as a problem. So if I go into a situation thinking that I'm right all the time or thinking that I know what to expect or know what to do, I can actually isolate myself from people um, because I might look like a know-it-all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be socially problematic. Yeah. And, you know, when's the last time you were like, yay, know it all. I just love them so much. <laughs> to be around yeah. mm -hmm. So what happens in terms of those characteristics for people who are under controlled? How are they different? Yeah. So they are actually very different. One of the biggest things that we see in under control is high reward sensitivity. So that would mean a stimulus comes and they're so excited about it. Like the example would be something like, oh my gosh, it's a pencil. Look at it. It's a sticker. This is so exciting. Have you seen my sticker? You know, and you just get so pumped. And, and here's the thing. It's kind of like really fun to be around people that have high reward sensitivity because you kind of want to join in. And, um, I, I always like to say my sister has high reward sensitivity. She can be talking about Disney World or something like that. And she's just like, her face is so expressive and her hands are moving and she's just feeling it. And you can feel the excitement. It's just wonderful. And you kind of want to be around her because you're just like, I want to go to Disney World now. This sounds amazing. And yeah, she sounds fun. She is. She's super fun. Um, and then there's this, this other thing that under control people do, which is kind of cool. It's the opposite of the um, high detail focus processing. It's called global focus processing. So being able to really see the forest and not just the trees. So I can actually see the whole perspective of something and I can take other people's perspectives and I don't really get upset if someone like challenges my perspective. I can just see everything and I kind of go, oh, this helps my global view, which is really, really, really cool. Uh, and then low inhibitory control, which would be the idea of, oh, you know, well, I want that cookie and I'm going to go and buy that couch because I saw it and I want it and I'm going to go and, you know, sort of pick up things and, and do them and then I'm going to tell you everything that's on my mind and I'm going to explain all this stuff. So the emotions and are coming out more quickly with low inhibitory control. And so it's, uh, it can look really fun. It can also look very out of control as well. So in the under controlled side, what they actually need to do is move towards the center also, but they need to learn emotion regulation skills and they need to learn 
how to actually be more in control of their actions. Yeah, a little bit less impulsive, it sounds like. Right. So sometimes, you know, a negative thing about under control would be like, you know, if I have a headache and I'm under controlled, I might not go to work and then I might get fired Mm -hmm. because I might be just like, no, I'm not doing it. I don't feel, I don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. Overcontrolled people are not saying, I don't feel like it. They're going to work with the headache and the migraine. What? (laughs) No matter what. And under control people are like, oh, whatever, I'll get another job. And so... Um, it can look a lot more volatile to be an under controlled person. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you about some of the, the, there are four main common deficits associated with over control. Can you kind of sure. walk us through? I think we've touched on those a little. Can you walk us through those a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. So, so over control at leaning people tend to lack receptivity and openness. Okay. So might not want to take risks. And they're really hypervigilant for threat like we were talking about. And they don't really want to do new things. And they tend to discount feedback that's critical that doesn't really fit their point of view very quickly. So it makes it actually very hard to have an open, receptive relationship with a a maladaptive or controlled person because they are very closed-minded individuals. And they lack, in addition to this, flexible responding, which is the second one. So if you think about someone that might not be very flexible, they probably have very rigid routines. They prefer order and structure, hyper-perfectionistic. They really see mistakes everywhere, especially in themselves. And they like to compulsively plan and rehearse. A lot of times, some of my clients, um, you know, plan what they're going to say, even how they're going to order a pizza you know, on the phone because it's just so, you know, part of their um, biology actually having to like feeling like they have to rehearse everything, even something as small as that. And then high rule governed behavior and moral certitude. So an example that how, how you might, that might show up is something like uh, if, if I'm, let's say I'm on a, a subway and um, there's a bunch of people and all of the seats are taken and then someone that might have some sort of disability where they're using a crutch or, you know, maybe a broken leg or something like that. Um, and then an over-controlled person might go uh, to someone that's sitting in a quote unquote handicapped spot might be like, get up. How dare you be sitting in that thing? This is not okay. You need to give up and give your seat away. That high moral certitude can actually look really aggressive sometimes, but it's coming out of this rule of don't sit in a seat that is designated as a um, disabled person's seat. And it comes out of this like actually loving pro-social thing a lot of times, but most of the time it's actually looks very odd. I've seen that before actually with people. And I I can think of actually some client examples where there's actually something sort of moral and values-based underneath it, but the way it's getting expressed causes all kinds of problems. Yeah. You end up getting in fights with people or, coming across in this very angry, like you're wrong kind of You're way. wrong. Yeah. yeah. And um, that would be an in public example. Generally speaking, most over-controlled leaning people are very uh, behaved, so, so to speak, in public. Um, but sometimes, you know, everybody leaks, right? You know, we can only hold it together for so long. And so you might see a moral certitude leakage in public versus maybe Other times, those kinds of anger expressions are really only happening behind closed doors or in the therapist office. Okay. So um, the third third deficit is emotional expression and awareness issues. So I might be, uh, and obviously this is a podcast, so people can't see my face, but what I would be showing to Debbie right now is a inhibited expression, which is a very flat face. A flat face looks like no expression, and it has, um, generally speaking, like no eye movements, no face movement. It looks, it's actually called a lot of times neutral expression, but it's the thing that tends to put people on edge because it's such an ambiguous signal that nobody really knows what the signal is. Show us. We'll do a video. <laughs> okay. So here's an, here's, an inhib- yeah. here's an inhibited expression. So what do you see, Deb, when you when you see me do that? I just feel like you hate me. Yeah, it's kind of (laughs) me. What did I do? Yeah, and so it actually looks kind of 
a bit like I'm angry or something and I'm really not. It could actually be a very neutral expression. The other one might be something called a disingenuous expression. And uh, what I'll be showing Debbie right now is me smiling kind of like really big and like got a lot of teeth and it sort of looks fake as in uh, if you've ever someone said like, you know, you're going to take a photo together and then um, for some reason they're fumbling with the, the camera and then all of a sudden you're just like, take the stupid photo and you're like holding this you're terrible trying. grin and you're feeling kind of icky. So um, let me do one of those really quick. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what do you see? <laughs> it just looks like I don't know. It look, it does. It looks fake. Yeah. Or like a little too forced. Smiling when we're distressed is actually something that we really look at or giggling when we're distressed is a disingenuous expression. Like a nervous laughter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so good to be here. So it's okay. really, it can be kind of uncomfortable for people. Yeah. Well, okay. Listeners, you got to check out, we're going to post some video <laughs> to, you got to see it. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so part of this lack of emotional expression and awareness is also a, a minimization of, of distress. So sort of not really letting people know the, how uncomfortable someone is in a particular situation. And then low awareness also of the fact that smiling or giggling like that is really weird for people. It actually looks very odd. And so does that flat face. And here's the hard thing about it is that over-control people tend to know that something is wrong and they're not connecting with people, but they can't really put their finger on what's wrong. And that's really painful for them. And nobody's actually saying like, you know, Hope, hey, when you smile and giggle like that, it actually makes me think you're going to like murder me or something like that. You know, it's like kind of like, what is she signaling right now? Um, or that flat expression looks like you hate me. Nobody's really giving them that feedback. And part of learning to deal with your over control is actually noticing what's going on on your face. You know, how aware are you of it? So we're jumping the gun here, but to get into the treatment, but do you tell people? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Say, absolutely. Listen, when you look at me like that, I feel like you hate me. Well, we do it in a kind of different yeah. way than okay. that, but, um, but yeah, we do actually let people know uh, what's going on in their, in their social signaling. Okay. That's a teaser for the part on RODBT. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So um, the fourth deficit is uh, the lack of social connectedness and intimacy. So that would mean um, maybe having aloof relationships or distant relationships, you know, not really feeling close to people. And so that doesn't necessarily mean lack of contact. You know, this is a really important point. Um, Over-controlled leaning people might be very polite and social because they're following rules, but they actually don't feel close to people and they feel like they can't ever get this level of intimacy with someone. And they might have like, a lot of friends, or, um, but they're not really diving deep into them. Or they might be very isolated as well. So you could see very pro-social over control, or you could see very isolative social uh, um, over control where they're actually not having a lot of relationships and, and might be kind of hermity. Okay. And, and that lack of social mm-hmm. connection, the sort of loneliness, is really a key part of the suffering with over control. Is that right? I remember reading about that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's all kinds of reasons that people aren't socially connected and intimate. And, you know, some of the things that over control people really struggle with is uh, because they have this high detail focus, they might be doing what we call like social comparing or ranking themselves. So for example, you know, it doesn't like with you and I, like if I were to say, oh, you know, well, where did you go to college? And if I think you, if your college was better or worse than mine, I might actually feel terrible uh, about myself, about it. Or I might think, oh, well, why does she even like me? Because, you know, she went to this better school than I did. And, oh, I just am a terrible person. And I start to do these comparisons or, or something like uh, I might start to compare myself in other kinds of ways about body image. Um, intelligence level, um, money, all kinds of ways that we compare ourselves to people and they really hurt. And then I might get really envious and I might get bitter as well. So envy and bitterness are, are really big things. And envy is just a kind of a reminder for people. It's different than jealousy. Jealousy is 
um, of being afraid to lose something that we already have that is important to us. And envy is wanting something that we don't have, and it can be positive or negative. So for example, if I um, want something that someone has, and then I look at them with sort of helpful envy, and I'm like, oh, well, I need to do this and this and this to actually achieve this wonderful goal. That's really helpful envy. But if I'm like, you know, looking at someone and I want to achieve some something that they have, and then I start gossiping about them, and I'm like, Debbie, can you believe that person that they're doing this thing? Da, 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 da. That's kind of the unhelpful envy. And it actually isolates me because what it's signaling to someone else is something like, oh, well, if I'm gossiping about that person to you, who else am I gossiping about you to? Mm-hmm. Ouch, right? <laughs> like you can't trust that when people mm-hmm. are sort of trying to knock other people down. Yeah. Wonder what they're doing to you behind the scenes. Right. And so if I'm yeah. bitter, think about this. If I'm a bitter person and I'm feeling like resentful all the time, I'm not going to want to be close to people and I'm going to mistrust a lot of people. And I'm going to think, you know, nobody's ever going to really get me. And then it further isolates me. And it's kind of like a loneliness trap. And then I might stop being very empathetic to people uh, and I might not validate people. So it's all sort of intertwined and it's, it is a big trap. Yeah. We did an episode a while back for those who are interested in learning more about this, about loneliness and social connection and some of the behaviors that people uh, get into in social situations that might actually make things worse. Oh yeah, absolutely. It is. It's like a big cycle. And you know, uh, one of the things that we actually talk about is, is, um, and excuse my language here when I say is getting out of your hell. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of know that you're in it. And how do you actually climb out of it? Because it's really not fun and it's very painful to be in this over-controlled trap. Yeah. Yeah. And some of those um, the emotional kind of blunting or holding in the emotions that happens, I think there's some research about how people actually find it hard to connect that even if your emotions are unpleasant ones or something like that, it actually helps connect you to people to show a little bit of that emotion. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're totally right. One of the thing, uh, skills that we, we teach over controlling people to do is actually to show distress sometimes because um, it can be really helpful to actually let you know that I'm in pain and I not, might need help. Yeah, it sort of yeah. humanizes us with each other mm-hmm. too. And if you can open up to people, then they feel like they can open up to you and it builds that bigger connection. And right there, that's the key uh, to getting out of over control, maladaptive over controls. Open expression equals trust equals social connectedness. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, this is helpful to give a sense of what over control is and isn't and how it works. Um, So we're going to continue in our next episode talking about the gold standard treatment for over control, which is radically open DBT. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com.